Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and I'm going to start at verse 25 and this is what it says. Even the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, look at what you were when God called you. Not many of you were wise in the way that the world judges wisdom. Not many of you had great influence. Not many of you came from important families. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose what the world thinks is unimportant and what the world looks down on and thinks is nothing in order to destroy what the world thinks is important. God did this so that no one can brag in his presence. Because of God, you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. In Christ we are put right with God and have been made holy and have been set free from sin. So as the scripture says, if someone wants to brag, he should brag only about the Lord. Pray with me. Jesus, this day give us ears that hear and hearts that respond. And may we be thankful, thankful for this time. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Fellow was looking for a hearing aid, walked in the hearing aid store, turned to the salesman, said, how much are your hearing aids? The salesman said, our hearing aids go from $1.50 all the way up to $25,000. The man said, wow, $25,000, what do I get for a $25,000 hearing aid? The salesman said, well, it's made in Switzerland, it has a lifetime warranty, and not only that, it translates into three different languages. The man said, that's very impressive. How about the the hearing aid for $1.50, what do I get for that? He said, well, it's just a button with a wire attached to it. The man said, does it work? The salesman said, no, not really, but you'll be surprised if you put the button in your ear and hang the wire down to your pocket, just how loud people will talk. <laughs> well, the man thought about it. He said, spare no expense. I'll take that $25,000 hearing aid. So everywhere he went, he bragged about the hearing aid, that it would made in Switzerland that it had a lifetime warranty and it translated into three different languages. Friend asked him, said, what kind is it? He said, oh, it's about 10 till 5. <laughs> I love that story. I love that story. And, and it just shows it doesn't pay to brag. Paul was having all kinds of trouble with folks bragging. He was writing a letter to a church that, that folks were bragging. One was saying, well, you know, I follow Apollos. Another says, yes, well, I follow Cephas. And another says, I follow Paul. And Paul says, cut it out. Stop your bragging. You're just separating yourselves from each other. You're dividing up into different camps. I didn't die for you on the cross. And neither did Cephas and neither did, did Apollos. Jesus Christ died for you on the cross. If you want to brag about anything, brag about him. And you Greeks, you Greeks, you, you've long been prideful because you have a long history of, of, of philosophy. 
and you brag about the, the, the intellect and your wisdom. You Jews, you have a long history of your moral purity, and, and you brag about your, your moral purity. Cut it out. Because the, the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisest wisdom. And the, the weakness of God is stronger than the greatest moral strength. Cut it out. If you want to brag about something, that's where he ends up. Brag about God. Brag about God. Well, he borrows that verse from, from Jeremiah. If you want something to brag about, brag about God. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Something to brag about. To brag about God. In our prayer, we can brag about God. And you know, all during the day, we can brag about God. Even to those that we're closest to. We can brag about God, and, and if we do that, I just have a hunch that we'll find ourselves, even, even in talking to strangers, we'll be bragging about God. And the first thing that I want to talk about this morning is brag about His love. Brag about His love. In the mid-1950s, Bennett Cerf was um, one of those celebrities that was seen in a lot of different places. Bennett Cerf it helped start Random House Publishing. He was an author. He was a publisher. He was a, a humorist. And people generally just liked hearing him talk because he, he had a very warm, winsome personality. So he would be on a lot of different game shows, a lot of different uh, discussions. And one of those discussions was a radio program by NBC called Conversations. In this particular radio program, they would get together a panel of folks that, and they would talk about some of the issues of the day. And, and they were given a question to, to talk about for 20 minutes. And at the end of that 20 minutes, they would settle on a, a key answer. Well, the question for the day was, what are people most afraid of? Well, in the mid-1950s, almost immediately, they came up with polio. Yes, it was a, a virus that, that people were very frightened by. It was crippling people. It was killing people. And, and it, was, it, it was all over the world, and they talk, talked about that for a while. Communism was one of the main topics of its day. And, and then they began talking about nuclear annihilation. And as they talked about it, they went around for 20 minutes. And then the moderator at the end said, okay, well, what have you all come up with? And then the moderator stopped and he said, well, you know, Bennett, usually you talk a lot more than you have today. You hardly spoke at all. And that's when Bennett Surf said, well, I've been thinking something, something totally different. And, and in a way, it seems sort of trivial. But I think what people are most afraid of is not being loved. Well, that's the first human emotion that's mentioned in the Bible. The fear. The fear that, that God is there in the Garden of Eden and He says, Adam, where are you? And Adam says, I hid for I was afraid. That he had disobeyed God and he was afraid that God wouldn't love him, so he hid. He was afraid what God might do, that God might not accept him. So he hid. I think that's the most universal of, of all the, the fears that people have. Fear of not being loved. Fear of not being accepted. Fear of rejection. And Jesus doesn't leave us alone with that fear. That when Jesus set out to say the best thing he could about God, he said God so loved the world. Not that God so tolerated the world or that God just could found the world unbearable, but still he worked through it. He says God so loved the world. And God so loved the world that he gave. He didn't wait till the world responded to his love. He didn't wait till the world said, yes, we really, no. He, he so loved the world that he gave. And he gave that that was most precious. 
not just something to see if they would respond. He gave what was most precious. He gave his only begotten son that whoever. Now, Jesus starts off talking about what's most general. God so loved the world, and now he gets down to what's most particular. Whoever. Whoever believes in him, and and that word believe, that's where we sometimes stumble because in English we think of believe has something to do with our head, that that we have mental assent to a list of rules or something like that. But in Greek, the word believe, it, it, it has the exact same root of the word faith. It's pistis or pistuos. And, and that, that word means literally to lean on, to rely on, to trust in. That God so loved the world that, that whoever leans on him, whoever relies on him, who trusts in him, that it's the kind of relationship that you have with, with someone that, that you begin to know them so much that you have confidence in them. That whoever has confidence and this love should not perish but have eternal life now so often we think that eternal life is a few years added on after you die but that's not what Jesus is talking about Jesus is talking about a quality of life a texture of life that starts in the here and now and it and it goes on forever this is what Jesus says in his prayer to God in John chapter 17 verse 3 he says this is eternal life that they know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent did we begin to to brag on his love and the quality the quality the texture of life, that it changes, that it changes the way that we, we pray. And we begin to, to brag on His love, not our ability, but, but His love. And we begin to see that, the, that, that, that love, that it's reflected through everything we go through during the day. Not only that, when we begin to share that, that bragging about His love, with those that we're closest to, it changes that relationship as well. And before long, it comes up in conversation in the way that we, we speak to and that we, we treat others. Brag about his love. Brag about his love. But it doesn't stop there. We've got something else to brag about. We can brag about his forgiveness. First Corinthians Chapter 1, verse 30, we read it this morning. It says, in Christ, we are put right with God. We are made holy, and we've been set free from sin. Put right, made holy, and set free from sin. Those are not our actions. We aren't the ones that put ourselves right or make ourselves holy or set ourselves free. Those are all God's actions. That's what God, God did. God did that that we couldn't do. That there on the cross, when Jesus gave his life, he, he forgave all that's past, all that's present, and all that would be. He wiped it away. He did what we couldn't do. And when he rose from the grave, he not only put things right, but he made us holy. That he began to live his life through us. And that he begins to change us day by day, step by step. Everything that we do. And not only that, he set us free. Set us free from all those, those things that would crush us, defeat us, and the sin that would destroy us. That the, the, the chains are broken. And we're set free. He does what we can't do for ourselves. 1 Peter 3.18 says, Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God. It's not that we, we snatch God out of heaven or we go find God, that he brings us to God. He does what we can't do, that we brag about his forgiveness. I have a good friend named Bob. Bob has a radio program 
Bob Christopher, it's AM 590, and it's called, it's called Basic Gospel. People call in to his radio show, and he, uh, he and his team begin to answer some of the questions they have. One day, Bob and I were talking, and I, I asked him, I said, what's the, the number one question that people have? He said, oh, that's easy. He said, the number one question people have is, can I be forgiven? That, yeah, they understand that God forgives, but that there's something that they feel that they've done, something that, that might be beyond God's forgiveness, something that, that makes them too far gone. And that question still is there, can I be forgiven? I began to try and figure out a a way to talk about this, an illustration, and all illustrations fall short, but imagine for a minute that you go on vacation. You pay somebody to cut your grass, and you're gone for two weeks, not knowing that in that first day that you were gone, the, the person that you paid to cut your grass, they got sick. They had to go into the hospital, and for two weeks, your grass has been growing. You get home, and it, that, that grass, it's calf high. Well, you're in trouble. You know you need to get it cut. You need to get it cut now. And uh, if, if not, uh, you, you stand the chance of scalping your, your yard and it being dead for the rest of the summer. And then you remember that your neighbor has a, a ride mower. It's a John Deere. It's a great riding mower. And he's offered it to you several times. But you've never really needed it. At least you never thought you did. But this is the day that you know that you need his John Deere riding mower. And so you start making your journey over to your neighbor. You're walking through your yard, your grass, through the grass, and you're just thinking about how big a chore this is, is going to be. It's calf high, and that's when his dog comes out to greet you. Well, you love dogs, but this dog is a dachshund. Uh, if you've ever had a dachshund, which I've had a dachshund, I, they're great dogs, but, you know, they're kind of yappers. They sometimes are kind of nippers, too. And this particular dog howls all night, and he's messed up your yard more than once. And you're going across, you're frustrated to begin with, and he gets in your way, and so you give him a little punt. And that's when you look up and you see your neighbor standing on his front porch, and he's watched the whole thing. Now, before you ask for his help, you've got some work to do. And though this is not a perfect illustration, before we go to God, knowing that, that God has forgiven us, we've got some work to do. And the word that the Bible uses is repentance. We don't go up to the porch and, and boldly start claiming what what rightfully has been offered to us? No, we go humbly, knowing that, that we've got to come clean, knowing that we've, we've got to admit, knowing that there's some work to do to build that relationship, that that's where faith comes in. That's where belief comes in, to lean on, to rely on, to trust in that relationship. And that's the forgiveness that, that God offers you and for me. Yes, it does require something of us, not for the forgiveness, but so we'll receive it. So we'll establish the relationship that's already been offered. We've got to come clean. We've got to repent that humbly we, we, we come in order to receive. We can brag about that forgiveness, not about how good we are, or how much we deserve it, because we certainly don't, but we can brag about God. We can brag about God, yes, in our prayer. And all during the day, we can brag about God, His forgiveness, and and we can share that, that bragging about God with those that are closest to us. And before long, before you know it, you know, that, that conversation, it seeps into all conversations we have, even, even with strangers. 
we've got something to brag about. We can brag about his love. We can brag about God's forgiveness. And the, the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is we can brag about his children. I read a story that years ago, President H.W. Bush went into a, a nursing home. He saw an old, older fellow standing in the, the, the hall, and he walked up to him, and very kindly, gently, he stuck out his hand. He looked the old man in the eyes, and he shook his hand, and he said, Do you know who I am? The old man lifted his eyes and said, No, but if you ask the nurse at the front desk, she can tell you. <laughs> well, everyone doesn't have the same perspective that we have. Everyone doesn't come from the, the same the same place that we do. People don't think the same way that we do. But you know what? It's not necessary for us to love them. It's not necessary for us to encourage them. It's not necessary for us to build them up. It's not necessary that they think the same way we do, that they believe the same way we do in order for us to, to brag on them. They're God's children. Fred Craddock tells a story about a missionary named Oswald Golter. He was a missionary in the 1940s to China. His mission board had, had sent him money to pay for his passage to come home after he'd been there for 10 years. He made his way to India. He was there at the port waiting to take the next leg of his trip. He'd heard that there were some refugees that were stuck there in the port. They were living in a warehouse that, that there were very few people places where these refugees could land well he went in to to try and to talk to them and then it was Christmas time and he said Merry Christmas the refugees said we aren't Christians we don't believe in Christmas he said okay well is there something that you want for Christmas they said we don't believe in in Christ we don't believe in Christmas he said, okay, well, is there something that you'd like? Something that I can do for you? Something that you've been stuck here for a while? Is there something that I can, can get for you? Well, after talking for a little bit, the discussion came down to that there were these German pastries that they really, they really liked, that they really enjoyed. Well, they were in India. And the Oswald Golder went all over the, the city there to find these these pastries. If there was a, a, a baker somewhere there that, that could, could make these pastries, he cashed in his ticket home to purchase baked goods for these people. And he brought in baskets of them, basket after basket, and he, he brought them to these refugees there. And years later, he was telling this story, and one of his students asked him, he said, sir, he said, these people didn't even believe in Jesus. Why did you do this for them? And Oswald Golter said, no, they didn't believe in Jesus, but, but I do. And this is what Jesus says in John 13, 35. He says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples. If you have love, love for one another. It's not our knowledge. It's not our purity. It's not what we've done. It's the way that we love. The way that we love as children. It's not because they think like we do or that they believe like we do or they act the way that we think that they should. We live in a time right now where folks are trying real hard to divide us one from another, to polarize us. And they use all different kinds of ways to do it. The way that people think, the way that people act, the way that they point out our differences, as if that should make a difference in the way that we love. We've got something to to brag about. It's the God that loves us. It's the God that forgives us. And a God that empowers us 
to do what we can't do on our own. Not only to receive that forgiveness, but to, to love others. We can brag. We can brag about His children. We can build them up. We can encourage them. We have it within us. This morning, it may be that um, you knew the love of God with your head, but it's not something that you, you ever bragged about in your prayers during the day or even shared with another person. Or it may be that you knew His forgiveness in your head, but you didn't brag on that forgiveness. That you didn't, you didn't come to him humbly. So you thought that there was something that still inside of you that he couldn't forgive because you hadn't built that relationship. He forgives you anyway. Or it may be that there's been a distance between you and someone else. And maybe someone that, that you know, know well. But there was this distance. Hear the good news. Jesus Christ has power. Power that you and I don't have. Power to reach out b- b- beyond loving just those that, that are easy to love. To even love those that are different. Those that don't believe, those that don't think, those that don't act the way that we believe and think and act the way that we, we think that they should. This power is available to you today. And I want to invite you to receive the power of His Holy Spirit this day. Join with me in prayer. Let's pray. Jesus, Your power... It's not just for someone else. It's a power that, that we need this day. That we might be changed. That we might be transformed. That we might be made into people different than we were yesterday. That we might be made into a people that brag about your love. That brag about your forgiveness. And we brag on your children. We encourage them. We love them. We build them up. Lord, we know we don't have the strength to do this. And when you rose from the grave, you gave us strength we don't have. You rose to give us that strength. And this morning, I ask that you give. That you give that strength to those that this morning that, that turn to you, that ask. Humbly and earnestly for that strength. It's a transforming strength. It's your transforming spirit that lives your life through us. May this gratitude be something we practice in our prayer during the day with those we are closest to and even in our conversation to the stranger. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, Just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, Thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online. 
but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.